Let's see, check, check. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Hey, guys, uh, I'm Paul, new face here, first time at the conference. Really, really honored to be here. Tons of names and faces that I've seen you know, on YouTube videos and reading in books and stuff, and it's just a, it's a real pleasure to actually meet a lot of you guys. Uh, my name's Paul. I'm here with my father-in-law, Tom, and our ops manager, Hayden, uh, representing Southern California, of all places. Uh, I want to tell our story real quick, because we're first-generation farming family. Uh, 2012, I was coming out of the Marine Corps, had some really bad health problems. I was dealing with arthritis and really low energy, brain fog, uh, 22, 23 years old. College athlete, really active guy. Couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And started eating this paleo diet, which I was just not a believer in. And pretty soon, my body was regenerated and started feeling like a kid again. We started buying a lot of local food, organic food, buying the best stuff that we really could. Um, I was coming from growing up in downtown Seattle with zero interest in food or farming. No interest in food or farming at all, uh, other than the consumer. About a year in, we started buying a lot of grass-fed, free-range, cage-free, organic, or so we thought, type of meats. And uh, the more we started to look into this, and my skeptics sort of kicked in, and I started researching it and learning what these labels actually meant a lot of the time. And I, I became pretty disheartened with the fact that Free-range chickens typically spend 99% of the time indoors. A lot of grass-fed beef was actually finished in a feedlot. Antibiotic-free chicken can actually be given antibiotics almost their whole life. It has more to do with the antibiotic residue in the meat. Uh, and then we just became pretty bummed out about it. And as a family in 2012, we were actually joking around about getting 50 chickens for the backyard. So my father-in-law had a little backyard area, and we thought, oh, wouldn't that be funny to get some birds for the backyard and just raise them up? Ha ha, big joke. Uh, my brother-in-law, Rob, he disappeared from the room for about five minutes, came back, and he said, hey, guys, I just ordered those 50 chicks you guys wanted me to order, you know? I said, we, what? You know, never raised a dog, really, in our lives, man. What are you doing here? He said, they're going to be here in two weeks. Uh, so we busted out Pastured Poultry Profits by Joel Salatin and started doing as much research as we could. We had no preconceived notions about how to do this, so we raised the birds outside on pasture, didn't give them any antibiotics or drugs, and... To this day, I don't even really know which ones you would give them if they got sick. Uh, we rotate them every day to fresh pasture and just really uh, stuck to that. About two weeks in, we realized it was going to be more than we bargained for. So we had each put in $500 for a total of $2,000. Uh, and we quickly realized it was going to cost more than that to get a plucker and to get a scalder and feed all these birds and raise all these birds. And so this was back in 2012. I thought, well, let's sell a few of these birds, you know, and, and help offset the cost. And so we put some things up online, and about a week later, all 50 birds had been completely pre-sold, and they were only this big at that point if you ever raised chickens. And that was a little bit of an eye-opener for us. Pasture poultry seemed to have a pretty good market, and by the time we harvested, slaughtered, which was a, a YouTube with an iPad here and a chicken in a kill cone here, and kind of back and forth trying to figure it out, uh, we had about 100 families on a waiting list. And so we said, well... I was pretty successful, you know, let's do another round. And then we did 100 the next time, same thing happened. And we did 200 the next time, then we did 500, and then I did 1,000 birds. And pretty soon, uh, we were sitting there kind of looking at this, and I was working as a CPA at the time, you know, sitting at a desk under fluorescent lighting, working on Excel spreadsheets all day. And this farm lifestyle looked pretty appealing. Um, so my wife and I, we moved from Newport Beach, California, out to the to sort of the country of California and uh, decided to make a go at this full time way before the business was ready for it. Um, but sure enough, we moved in, nine people, 1,700 square foot house, took no salary for a couple of years, invested every dollar of profit that we could back into the business. And uh, today it's really exciting kind of how we've grown. So we've added sheep, uh, we're doing pork, we're actually having our first batch of cattle delivered today, which is a really exciting day for us. It's been a six-year dream to sort of start getting into the grass-fed beef business. Uh, we just never had the capital or the land base to do it, and we finally have that. Uh, we're, we're, today, we're producing about 8,000 broilers a week on pasture. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of the system. Uh, daily move, moving the birds every single day, selling a lot fresh into restaurants. Happy to talk about that kind of stuff. Wherever you guys want to take this conversation, happy to do that. Um, we're a broiler-centric pastured livestock farm. Brothers are definitely our main thing. Everything else supports that. So we run 50 to 100 head of Dorper sheep, uh, maybe 50 to 100 head of the Cooney Cooney pigs, which we can also talk a lot about that. Uh, that's a specific application on our ranch. And then we're going to add in 40 cattle today. Uh, two businesses. We have Pasture Bird, which does all the production and wholesale. 
Um, we sell to, like I said, about 60 restaurants in California, Arizona, Nevada. And then we have um, Primal Pastures, which does direct-to-consumer online retail. That was our original company. That's the one Hayden's sort of taking the reins on now. And that company ships about 1,300 uh, mail-order packages across 12 states every single month. Uh, feed about 7,000 families, something like that. So it's, it's really been an absolute blessing. Um, I know we're going to get into some of the questions and stuff like that. I just wanted to give you a little background on how we got into this and where we're at. So thank you. They said, uh, oh, whoa, whoa. They said do the PowerPoint. Here's a couple of pictures from our ranch. We run the mobile greenhouse from uh, Cobb Creek Ranch out in Texas. We're modeling our stuff after their system. It's a 36 by 20 foot floorless greenhouse. Uh, we run about 500 to 550 broilers in each one of these every single day. They're moved to fresh pasture. This is one of the units that we use to move the coops every single day. It's just a, a telescoping forklift. Found better luck with a little bigger tractor, less compaction with the bigger tires. Uh, you can see the sides sort of open up and down. The doors open back and forth, but the birds, common misconception, the birds stay inside of that unit on our system 24-7 every single day. Uh, that's for predator control. It's also because broilers typically want to be in the shade. We talked about jungle fowl. They typically want to be in the shade uh, in the middle of the day, and it allows us to really control the application of manure. So we're running about six, uh, about five pounds per square foot of poultry when they're full grown. That's a good load of manure going down in the soil. Uh, we've seen some really, really exciting stuff. So this was actually former potato ground uh, fumigated for 50 years. And when we got out there, it was about 0.8% organic matter. And in just two years, we're already up to 2% organic matter using no fertilizers or pesticide or anything like that. The, the poultry has a special function uh, in the ecosystem in that you input feed from off farm. It was good and bad, but the good part of it is that you can really regenerate the soil quickly um, because it's putting down a lot of manure and, they, and you can control it very tight in this system. We run two breeds. We run a Cornish cross on a conventional feed. That's typically our restaurant market. Uh, that's not how we got into the business. It's not really what I thought we would end up doing, but that's what the customers asked for. Cornish cross, conventional feed on pasture. That's what you're looking at right here, probably about four-week birds. Uh, and then we also run a Freedom Ranger bird out of... Uh, Freedom Ranger Hatchery in Pennsylvania. Uh, really, really great hatchery. The birds forage. are beautiful red birds. We feed them a certified organic and soy-free feed. We just found the, the chefs can't pay for it. Too expensive for them. <clears throat> uh, just talk a little bit about the other mixed livestock that we do. This is a Dorper sheep, and I'm showing a picture of farm tours. So farm tours have been instrumental for us being in Southern California. We have 22 million people within about two hours of the farm. We try to leverage uh, the pros and cons of Southern California as much as we can. We've had 15,000 visitors for our farm tours in the last three years. Uh, we do a lot having people out, really trying to show them the ranch, show them every single thing, and offer that full transparency. Um, and that's it. Thank you. You can also pull with a Jeep. Good morning. My name's Ethan Kelly. Ah, there we go. Came up. Um, I'm from May, Idaho. That's central Idaho. Um, and, and my wife and I have just, um, just recently, within the past couple of years, started raising um, pork on uh, my in-law's ranch. They, they run Alder Spring grass-fed organic beef. Um, and so I'll just sort of give you a bit of a background of myself. I'm originally from central Florida. Um, my family had no involvement in agriculture whatsoever, um, and I actually got into agriculture through my mother, who was very interested in um, eating well, eating, eating properly raised meats, um, and sourcing that. And so that's actually how I, how I got involved with a farmer in northern Florida, where I first, um, first sort of finished. I was homeschooled, and part of my homeschool was working on that farm, actually. Um, and so from there, I went and uh, worked for Joel Salatin. Um, many of y'all know him, uh, Polyface Farm. So I worked for him for a year and a half um, before coming out west and um, finding, my, uh, finding my bride over here. Uh, sorry, that's getting loud. Um, <laughs> so, um, 
So we got married. We wound up heading to Australia. We wanted to, we wanted to see a lot of different operations, learn how they do it, um, because they really had the grass-fed beef going. And uh, as much as we liked that, we wanted, to, we wanted to find something to add to that. Um, coming from Polyface, um, their internship program is very intensive on chickens, on pasture poultry, which went there for four months and I came away feeling like I know how to do chickens. I can do chickens. I could do chickens anywhere. And so I come to Alder Spring and many of y'all know probably um, in the West there is a bit of a ranching culture. It's not a farming culture. California might be exempt from that. Um, so I came there a little fired up. I was going to do maybe do some chickens or something. And there's a big, whoa, 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 whoa. He's going to turn Alder Spring Ranch into Alder Spring Farm. It's going to be turned into Polyface. And, and, and we're not that. Um, so it's taken a while, but I'm doing that anyways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we've, we've got into um, the pork, my wife and I, when we worked in a place in Australia. Um, they, they, uh, they had systems um, running, running pigs in hot wire. This was in New South Wales. So obviously we're a bit different. Um, and I think it was really key what was pointed out yesterday. There is no recipe. There's not a specific recipe to follow. There's principles in how to do it. Um, and you got to figure out what works best for you. And I'm not saying we have arrived, because we haven't. We're, we're still working on this. Um, but at any rate, I'll sort of run through what we do. We do not farrow. Um, we, we're seasonal right now, which is, which is really nice, especially with the two kids. It gives us a bit of a break. Um, but we pick up our piglets at uh, about two months. They'll be, you know, 40, 40 pounds-ish. Um, and we bring them and start them on a... Um, in a garden, actually, a fenced, enclosed area, because they don't come hot wire trained. So um, we'll run a hot wire in there, put feed and water on both sides of the wire. And if y'all aren't too familiar with pigs, pigs will always go forward. If they get shocked or hit, they're not going to back out. They're going to shoot underneath. Um, so, so that's why we put the feed and water both sides. That way, um, when they get hit, they run under, and eventually they sort themselves. Um, and so as soon as we can, as soon as grass is coming out, this picture um, was taken, uh, I think that was probably, what, mid-April, probably, um, when we were getting them out. Um, and these pigs just love the grass. So our, our idea is that we're going to put them on pasture, supplement feed. So they have free choice of all the grass they could want, um, the, and, and they love it. They go in there, they're grazing, they're rooting around. Um, and we, uh, we first started moving them once a week, um, and then we found that uh, that was too much disturbance for the land. Um, so last year we went to um, moving them every three days, uh, and that still might be too much disturbance. So this, this is all a, um, a, a work in progress right now, but uh, let's see if I can get this to change here. You know, I was born in what should have been the right date for this stuff, but it, it's, it is not working for me. Is there a specific place I should be pointing this? Hmm? Yeah, I'm, I'm hitting left. Should I try the other button? Well, maybe they can. What's that? Try it now. There we go. Okay. There's another happy pig. And pigs actually love to graze. They will actually go around, and I've seen a couple of them get down even on their, their elbows, and they're down there just grazing. Grazing like a cow. It's really cool to see. They do also go underground, though. And so where we've placed the pigs on our pasture, um, because as I'll show you later, they do have impact on land. Um, we put them on a place where we had quack grass really moving in, which isn't highly palatable for cattle. Um, so, but their, their roots, they have these, these long roots underneath, and they're really sweet, and we were hoping the pigs would really go for them, which they did. Um, they'd actually turn it up, and, and so we've really seen um, some new species, or, or not new for the area. We've, we've had more clovers moving in, uh, more desirable species for the cattle, 
Um, so we really wanted this to be a, um, a net gain for the ranch, for the cattle, um, not something that was, that, was, that was actually dragging it down or creating, creating issues at all. Um, so, oh, there we go. So um, this is pretty much our infrastructure for these pens. It's, it's um, the main goal of it was to try to keep it low cost. Um, my wife and I didn't have a whole lot of money to throw into this. Um, so we started small, we still are small. Um, we're growing as we can. But um, I think the key for us was to keep our infrastructure and overhead low. So this is sort of our setup here. We've got our hot wires. We started with three hot wires, wound up we only needed two. Um, because our ground was wet enough, we would, and we, this is irrigated ground, so we've got pivots going over it. It will stay green through the summer. Um, and unlike here, we don't run the pigs in the winter because that is not our growing season. <laughs> so, um, so we run our hot wire, um, and uh, the, the pigs really respect that. Once they've trained up to it, they respect it, um, and we just weed eat the line. Otherwise, we get a lot of uh, current pulled off that fence. There's that. Um, simple, simple hookups here. It's really quick to run these paddocks out. My wife and I do it with our babies on our backs. <laughs> um, and so we're feeding um, a mixture of wheat and peas. Um, we're, we're trying to stay away from corn. That's what our customers want. Um, and corn also, I think, is one of the higher crop sprayed with glyphosate, and that's something we really wanted to stay away from. We are not organic at this point. Um, the pasture's organic. The feed is as local as we can get, and we ensured that it was not sprayed with glyphosate for the harvest. Um, we just really did not want that on the direct seed feeding our pigs. Um, and also what we do with the feed is we have been experimenting with a sourdough culture. So what, what people have been making sourdough bread with years past, um, just, just getting natural cultures in, um, and those yeasts we then inoculate our feed with and we soak and ferment it for 48 hours. Um, and what that does, we've noticed it breaks down the feed more, it makes it more palatable for the pigs, and also what's coming out the back end, pigs, pigs shoot things right through their system. You put it in one end, it's out the other end, and it looks like you could feed it to them again. Not that we would. Um, <laughs> so, um, so this really helped with that. So they're, they're getting a lot more out of their feed. And we're, we're um, also, I talked about, you know, low infrastructure. It's very high manual labor. Um, and so, so that's sort of the transition is we can get the capital in, um, we can start working towards systems that maybe don't break the back as much. But we're young, so um, that's what we're doing at this point. A couple other pictures, trailer. Um, and then feed, feed systems. This is something I threw together. It, um, I think we're retiring this this past year now. Um, but this is simply a 55-gallon drum and some tires I picked up at the, uh, the local tire shop. Um, so it was pretty much, you know, the whole thing cost me about 15 bucks and a little work. Um, so so that, that it's, it's important, I think, to keep in mind you don't have to have all the new stuff, all the stuff that's perfectly designed for what you're going to do. You know, get into a little fabrication, throw something together, make something work, and get the ball rolling. It's, it's not a huge output that you have to that you have to do in order to get started. Oh, it quit. Oh, there we go. Okay, and here's our water system. In Idaho, unlike here, we have only 100 days that are frost free for growing. Um, and also what that means is in the middle of the winter we can get down to negative 30. So our frost line is down at five or six feet. So it's it we haven't figured it out yet. Um, some of it, you know, I'd like to consider this in the future, but uh, this is working really well for us as far as water system goes. We can't run lines and have pressurized water running to our pigs all the time. We have, um, we have just certain locations around the ranch um, for the cattle where we have water lines buried too. So we're running one of these IBC totes on a little trailer and we gravity feed out. Um, and that, that's been working really well for us. Um, we run in groups of 40 pigs. Um, and our, our paddocks here are about, I want to say about an eighth of an acre that we're moving every three days. Um, 
and that, that's been working well for us. There's the water they do like to get it dirty. We're considering going to nipple drinkers um, as an alternative to that um, because that is what pigs do. <laughs> um, here's moving them. Uh, we just have a hay wagon, and then we, we, uh, we put up some shade cloth here for them um, to keep them cool in the summer. Um, so we're, we're calling them right there. The pigs love to come to call them. We just lift up the wire, and they just get in a routine. Um, I've heard pigs, you know, they don't want to go through where they've seen a hot wire in the past. Um, we haven't found that to be an issue. As long as, it's, it, as we have a system to it and we maintain that, the pigs are ready. They, they, they know we've turned the wire off, and we lift that wire up, they shoot right under it, and they, they put their heads right down. Um, just another shot of some of the grass we're putting them into. We'll get it here. Um, cattle find them very interesting. They, uh, they come over and just watch. They, they don't know what those creatures are. Oh, and horses. If you have horses, be aware, they do not like pigs. They do not like pigs. It doesn't matter the horse we're riding. We had these right next to our driveway, and we'd be riding horses up to, and, and the horses, you know, they're walking along, pigs are over here, and then they, they do this. They, they sidestep around it the whole way as far, far away as they can get. So that, that's sort of interesting. And here's the not as pretty side of, uh, of pigs. They are a heavy impact on the land. So it's not something you're going to want to continue rotating through the same ground over and over again. It is a heavy impact. Um, and they, we, we didn't make that mud hole for them. They, they made that. <laughs> they will find ways to keep waters. I know at, uh, at Joel Salatin's, um, they would put pigs into their dams, their water reservoirs. And they were the best way. They'd spread corn out there for them. And it was the best way to actually seal up their ponds. Because um, pigs will find ways to hold water. So, so this is a reality. So, um, so this is an ongoing thing we're trying to work through. Um, pigs, you know, this, this, we probably had them in there a little bit longer than they should have been. We could have moved them a bit quicker here. Um, so what we're doing is we're broadcasting. This is barley. Um, and we broadcast that in the day before we move them. Um, that way the pigs can trample it in, get good seed to ground contact, and, um, and try to get some cover going on uh, back. This, this is sort of the little corridor where we feed them, and that's where usually the most impact comes. So we just try to hit any bare spots. We found the taller the grass, the less the pigs actually root. I think, you know, pigs are, can be a little lazy sometimes, and it makes it a bit harder for them. Um, but here's our regrowth we're getting. Uh, and we're getting that barley coming back. The cattle love it. And I want to actually experiment with running the cattle back in um, not too long after the pigs, once we get some regrowth, and, and hitting it pretty hard, some dense, um, dense numbers there. And actually, hopefully, we could be uh, leveling out some of this ground using their hooves to actually um, flatten that out again. I've probably got to speed up here. Sorry. If I can get it to move. There we go. OK, another shot of that the barley coming up, and then our plan is to seed um, perennials in as well um, and try to convert that away from the quack grass and back into more palatable, desirable species for the cattle. A um, couple pigs happy after a move. And this was as close as I could get to pigs riding off into the sunset. They didn't ride off that night, though. We, we loaded them in the trailer, and we got up early. We haul them quite a ways to get them uh, slaughtered. There's a good processor that we process our beef at, and so we had a relationship with them already. As, and as well, um, the, uh, the, the one guy was great at value-added products. So he's really good at the sausages, hams, bacon, and so we wanted to play to that strong suit with him. So, um, so we've been very happy with, uh, with what we've been getting from that. So I think that's the end of my deal, and I'll turn it. How do I get, oh, into the trailer? Well, this is, so I, we welded up these little panels here. That's hog panel, and then inch by inch steel there, we welded together. Put a little, um, I always want to call it a race, because I heard that term over and over again. In Australia, it's just a ramp. Um, and it's, it's basically, um, we tried to feed them, lure them in a little bit. Pigs are not like cattle. They are tough to herd. They really are. If they don't want to be there, they're not going to be there, unless you have a way of making them be there. So we tried to put feed in there, 
get them to come in, go ahead and close. All these gates lock up, um, and then we have a little ramp that goes up um, and a couple more panels on the inside of that to create a little alleyway. So it's really portable, it's quick um, to set up, and then we can close it off. And once they can't back out, they're going to go forward. And that's, that's really how we do that. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Well, no, no, once they can't back out of their, out of their um, alleyway, then they're going to go forward. They will. So, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> All righty, there you go. Hey, hey, so I have so many questions for this guy about pigs. Any of you guys, how many of you came to my ranch the other day? Oh, pretty much everybody. So I'm going to skip through a lot of my uh, slides. But um, did you guys have fun out there? Yeah. All right, cool. We didn't get to see the pigs. Um, one thing that, that um, you did get to see was the sheep. Um, and we do multi-species grazing. We do, uh, so I'm Lauren. For those of you that didn't go, I'm Lauren, Stemple Creek Ranch. My ranch is only about 30 miles from here to the west. Uh, we do 95% of our businesses grass-finished beef, um, maybe 4 or 5% is lamb, and the rest is pork. We do about maybe, I don't know, this year we're probably going to do 60 pigs. And I don't call them pasture pigs, I call them free-range pigs because I don't want to ruin my pastures by rotating them around. And they, they're in a, they live in a big, about five-acre grove of trees, and there's still green grass in there. And unfortunately, I didn't, I'm not prepared to show you pictures of those today because I didn't. I didn't put them on this PowerPoint, but our Instagram or Facebook has pictures of our pigs. And we, um, the thing that kind of blew my mind about the pigs, especially this year, because I've done smaller scale, like 10, 10 at a time or 20 total a year. And now we have uh, 19 in a group. And I went out with, uh, we have an organic non-GMO pellet that we get from Bar Hill over the hill here. And we feed that in... Um, kind of conventional self-feeders. Self, -feeder, self -feeders. Each one of them holds 1,000 pounds, and we have two of them in the, in the field that they're in. And uh, I went out there about two weeks ago, and I took a sack of corn and laid it on the ground, and the pigs didn't come running. And the pigs were all up in the, in the trees, rooting around, eating worms and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing. The pigs would rather eat the worms and the other stuff out in the field and the bugs than they will the corn. Like in traditionally growing up, if we had one or two pigs, we came with a bucket of grain, they'd come running for it and snort around. It was pretty wild. So that's why I'm so intrigued about how to get them into the corral or how to get them because April 15th, we're going to harvest these pigs and I'm not really sure how I'm going to get them in the, into the, into the, uh, um, the trailer. So we're going to try this plan. Okay, so I'm going to power through these um, slides. Uh, this is where we're at. You guys can see we're in Marin County, um, not far from the star. Uh, I'm actually the fourth generation, but there's five generations of ponches. I didn't get to show you guys this on the tour the other day, but Angelo, the bottom or the yeah, bottom right, the old, old guy, he's the one that immigrated from Garzano, Italy in 1897, and he really started this whole process. And, you know, I'm standing on all of those guys' shoulders for keeping the ranch going for the last 120-plus years and super blessed to, to have the opportunity to even come back and, and run the operation. Um, but with that comes a lot of pressure to be able to make it profitable. And we talk about sustainability and regenerative and all this stuff, and none of that really matters if it's not profitable. So that's why we're layering on additional uh, enterprises. And those of you that came out to the ranch, you know, we have like probably 10 enterprises at the ranch now. And one of them now becomes becoming pigs because pigs, people like bacon. And it works really good to be able to uh, bundle bacon and beef and filet mignons and, you know, bacon and all of those types of things. So we're bundling that. We've talked about poultry. Um, I think I talked to you guys that were out at the ranch. I don't want to touch a chicken or move a chicken, but I like chicken manure. Um, and we use chicken manure very effectively on the ranch by composting it with carbon. Well, I'm, I don't think I'll show you any pictures of that here, but um, what we do and why we're, you know, the land ethic, basically our whole business revolves around the land ethic 
and taking care of the, the property. And we want it to be healthy for the uh, consumer and the environment. Basically, we had to re reinvent our business with a direct-to-consumer focus if we were going to stay in business. Um, most of you that were here probably heard this, or that were at the talk probably heard this story, but um, when I started about 15 years ago, really getting a lot of skin in the game on the ranch, we, we had the intent of selling all of our beef to feedlots and getting a 10 or 20 cent premium. And we did that the first year and 30% of them got sick in a feedlot. And I was like, why are we doing this? We have to switch, you know, flip this business on its head and start selling direct. Um, so this is what the ranch looks like. This is in February. And where, where you guys were um, was way over on the far hill. This is on the east hill, kind of, where, or the west north hill, where you guys didn't make it. Um, I'm always uh, trying to build more soil. I think um, the, one of the very first speakers of this conference talked about what, what do we want this to look like two or three or four generations from now. And I don't know if the last two or three generations... Uh, if my family actually thought about that. They just basically made it so that we could do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And I'm thinking about that. Like, two, I'm planting trees right now that won't be full grown for 100 years. And I want my great grandkids to go, Grandpa, he was a smart son of a bitch. You know, <laughs> look at these trees, you know. I kind of want that to happen. So we're, um, we're doing the carbon farm planting. And the reason why we're doing it is because we want to put more carbon in the soil so that we can have greener grass longer and I think in the next five years probably we're going to have green grass or forbs on our ranch year round we already do but not to the point that it can we can actually finish cattle year round on my ranch alone we have to feed some hay or move the cattle to other ranches where the grass is greener um, <clears throat> we use we implement lots of different practices here on the ranch compost compost tea seawater which some of you heard about and probably rolled your eyes, but actually seawater has 80 different micronutrients that actually will help stimulate um, photosynthesis and actually create more grass. Uh, we use a refractometer. Um, every year is a different dance. That's vital um, for the younger generation that's coming in. It's never the same. I mean, three years ago in February, we got our very first rain for the year, and we got 13 inches of rain. This year, February, we got about 25 inches of rain, you know, and it's, you know, it's a dance. It's hard to plan and, and do that. Um, I know this is a multi-species uh, talk, so I'm going to kind of refocus on that, but we do, we do pigs now in sacrificial areas that we want to make better. We don't put them on our best ground. They do eat a lot of grass in those areas. Um, the sheep we graze, I think I might have some pictures of sheep in here, um, but we graze the sheep. Oh, I'm going to talk about this, too. That's a pretty cool picture, actually. Um, multi, you know, lots of diversity in the grass. Uh, we want lots of different things for the cattle and the sheep to be eating. Um, this is, you know, in another, well, it's April. This is around June 15th on our ranch. All the flowers are blooming. The grass is all headed out. The annual grasses are all headed out. We're getting more and more perennials. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do more of, and when I talked about having green grass year-round or forbs, is this is chicory. And um, this was an area that I actually heavily grazed, or frankly, overgrazed. We, got, we had like 300 head of cattle the 10th of November, and it rained 10 inches in you know, three days. And in, it's pretty hard to split up 300 pairs to be able to sort them out of a field that's you know, mud. So we just kept them there, made it a sacrifice field, and then we broadcasted the seed over the top. And this was a year later. We had a really good stand of chicory that went into the summer and reseeded, and it's still growing. And then uh, that's an actual chicory plant. has a deep tap root, breaks up the soil. It's really good. And lo and behold, there's life below that root. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. This is actually a pretty stunning... Um, Stunning description of what we've done. This is my family's ranch. This is looking out my, my parents' kitchen window at Stemple Creek, our namesake. And this is how we used to manage it. You know, we'd feed the cows right there next to the creek. The creek had no cover. The cows drank out of the creek. Um, and when you fast forward, this was about probably 19, 
85. Lots of erosion. Let's see. That's, this is the same creek now in 2019. And, uh, you know, basically you don't see any bare soil. You see lots of green cover and lots of biodiversity. There's 35 different types of birds that nest in that creek now. And that's regenerative. And that's sustainable. And we're getting a lot of, of good luck there. So 1990, 2010, 2018. The, the things about this that make me exciting is that happened in my lifetime. And, you know, we talk about Mother Nature as a way of healing herself. And this is, this is just prime example of how she does so. But you need to help her along. And multi-species can actually help along. I'm going to skip through this. This is compost stuff, grazing practices. These are some of our finishers. Um, is our carbon farm plan working or what, we doing, or what we're doing, is it working? Well, which side of the fence do you think is mine? My neighbor's on the left or on the right. So my neighbor has, and I love them, they're very nice people. I don't know why they don't look over the fence and say maybe we should change something. But they um, have about 80 cows there on 400 acres. They get one big huge pasture. The grass very seldom gets taller than it is in this picture. And you look over the fence, and we have two-foot tall grass. And, you know, we sell literally thousands of pounds more beef on less land than just by paying attention to the soil. And then so most of you are here because of multi-species grazing. is like you can layer different species on top of your main enterprise and get more get more pounds. So you add sheep to the cattle, even run them with the cattle. In our situation, we sell about 20% more protein on the same amount of land by running the sheep. They eat different things. The sheep thrive on the shorter feed. The cattle thrive on the taller feed. And where you guys were um, the other day, and you saw all those sheep, and we're grazing that pasture down real short, and then they're going to where the cattle just were yesterday when you were at the tour. And, and they're going to follow the cattle around. We don't do that as aggressively as we'd like to because coyotes are a big predator. And we can only put the sheep where, unless we do the woven wire fencing, you know, the, the, the little square white fence. Unless we do that everywhere, which we haven't done yet. We, we use it strategically, but not huge pastures. Um, and unless you do that, we don't run the sheep all over the whole ranch. We only run them into strategic pastures but they will follow the cattle. And they don't run together because we have guardian dogs that like to chase the cattle. And it's really hard to make fat grass-fed beef when they're getting chased around in circles all day. Um, so biodiversity, really key. Our pastures are getting better. We have pastures that are dominated by forbs, um, dominated by legumes, or dominated by grasses. None of them are perfect. But we're getting more of what looks like on the right, where you got bell beans and um, clovers and and grasses, and that's what our pastures will look like more in about a month and a half. Um, we also have honeybees on the property. We have about 500 hives that I've partnered with uh, one of my neighbors who's, uh, who's got a, a, a bee business, and they don't want the bees in the Central Valley of California. There's actually a huge business. That probably some of these bees from California go to South Dakota and Wyoming, other places, certain times of the year because they need to get them out of the Central Valley of California because the bees don't do well there. And that means multiple things. They, they make most of the money from their bees um, by pollinating almonds and alfalfa and other things. But the bees die when they live in the Central Valley because there's so much spray and other chemicals there. So when they bring the bees to my property, they thrive. They, get t they don't make a ton of honey, but they make tons of pollen, and they can split the hives more often. And they love our area. They actually pay us to bring their he bees and put them in a clean, fresh coastal air um, so they can split the hives more often. And we're, we're going to stack another enterprise into our business. We're going to sell honey, Stemple Creek honey. It comes from not my bees, but they live on my ranch, and they pollinate my flowers and that type of thing. The other thing that we do, biodiversity, multi-species, is we raise a lot of wildlife. We have these duck tubes. We put the duck tubes out in the pond, partially because I love to duck hunt. My wife always asks me, why do you raise them up and then shoot them? It's the same way with the cattle. You know, it's just, we're just, it's another uh, biodiversity thing that people love. So um, tours and events, I'm going to blast through this. We do this all the time, lots of tours and events. I haven't kept track of how many people we've had, but 
We just had 200 there this week right here. Um, and then the four, four main things about our story, taste better, better for the land, better for the animals, and it's better for the humans consuming our products. And that goes with the beef, the lamb, the pork, the honey, and maybe the milk and other things that I don't even know about, the chickens, the eggs that we're going to do down the pipeline. Um, and then this is my happy place. This is there where you guys were all the other day. Um, we've done some landscaping since then. But every year, if you happen to be close by within 100 miles and you want to t make the trek over, I cook a lamb and a whole bunch of steaks and a pig on Easter Sunday, and it's a potluck. I usually supply some of the booze and all of the meat, and everybody else, it's a potluck. So, um, so I'm sure you have lots of questions about um, the different grazing things, but the, my main message is I stack, I stack the different species on top of each other for financial reasons, um, for direct-to-consumer reasons, but the, it's just different ways that we can still benefit from the same land and regenerate the soil with different species at the same time make more profit. And it comes down to profit. Uh, nobody has talked about it yet up here, but probably poultry is the most profitable, rabbits and chickens and eggs. But then after that, lamb is very profitable to raise. It's very low input, like in terms of off-farm, and it raises, uh, we can raise amazing high-quality protein that tastes delicious, like world-class, without any inputs. And then the pigs, we are bringing inputs because they, they won't finish without any sort of grain on our property, but they're probably the single most profitable enterprise we have right now. We're making 500 to 1,000 bucks in pure profit off of pigs, and we make two to 300 bucks per lamb. And the beef, you know, the grass-fed beef, we have to keep those for two and a half to three years, and we're in them for probably 2,000 bucks before we even harvest them. So they're super capital intense, and they take a long time, and it's hard for cash flow to keep that thing cranking. Right now, at any one point in time, I might have a million dollars worth of cattle walking around that I need to charge myself interest on in order to make it a real business. So it's, it's all... It's all fun and games. But um, the last thing I want to say before questions is if there is young aspiring or old aspiring people that want to do add-on different enterprises onto my operation, I'm happy to have the conversation. I'll finance it, split the profits, or run it under Stemple Creek's brand um, because I think that's going to be the future of small, smaller local brands like mine. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.